You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is February 12, 2021, and I'm your host, Dr. Jay Portnoy. Our topic today, Allergy Journal Club. Our presenter is Dr. Jordan Pitt. He's an Allergy Immunology Fellow at Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Um, Dr. Uh, Jordan Pitt, one of our first-year fellows, is going to present two articles on the COVID-19 vaccine. So I'll let Dr. Pitt take it away. Thanks, Dr. Dowling. Um, so can everyone hear me okay and see the slides now? Yes. Okay, perfect. Um, okay, so I'm going to go through the... Um, the journal articles that were kind of the main ones of the phase three trials for both the Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines. Um, and I put a lot of information in the slides um, just so that this could kind of be a reference for people and um, an easier way to kind of go through the vaccine since I felt like um, it could be interesting for a lot of people. Um, and I'll just try and kind of pick out some of the high points as we go through. Um, so the first one um, is the BNT162B2 mRNA vaccine, which is um, known as the Pfizer vaccine. And this article was published on December 10th in the New England Journal of Medicine. So in their introduction section, um, the data presented is from the phase two slash three trial. Um, Dr. Pandya had talked about how some of the um, the phases kind of got combined with trying to speed through um, this process and get these vaccines available um, to people. So um, they did have some initial, you know, phase one trial stuff that was. Um, that was good, and so they were able to move on and kind of combine and do this. Um, the BNT162B2 um, is a lipid nanoparticle formulated nucleoside modified RNA encoding um, the SARS-CoV-2 full-length spike protein uh, that was modifi modified by two proline mutations to lock it in the prefusion confirmation. Um, and this was kind of a, um, a novel um, one you'll see in comparison to the Moderna. Um, so, yeah, they had good phase one safety and immunogenicity results. Um, and the, um, the mean titers um, after the vaccine exceeded um, the titers in patients who had just had the disease naturally. Um, and then the, what they call the reactogenicity profile, or basically side effect profile, um, was mainly short-term local and systemic responses. Um, so some general things about their method. So again, this was Pfizer and BioNTech were um, the ones involved, responsible for the design and the conduct of the trial and kind of everything. Um, they did actually have some subjects, uh, well, Sorry, we'll get to that. Um, their main subjects were 16 years of age and older and were healthy or had stable chronic medical, medical conditions. Um, and the exclusion criteria was um, a medical history of COVID-19 infection, treatment with immunosuppressive therapies, or an, an immunocompromising con condition. So those people were not included in the study. Um, the participants were randomly assigned to receive the vaccine or placebo, and they got two um, doses of the vaccine or pl placebo 21 days apart. So their primary endpoints for safety were specific local or systemic adverse, adverse events, as well as the use of antipyretic or pain medication within seven days after each dose. And so patients were, um, they recorded data in electronic diary, and they did have a subset of patients who were prompted um, daily to record any sort of side effects um, 
for a month after the second dose. And this is what they call the reactogenicity subset, so the people who were prompted. Um, but the rest of the people who got the vaccine um, were not prompted but could um, could just voluntarily get on and record um, side effects that they had, and they were encouraged to do so, just not prompted through this electronic diary, um, up through six months after the second dose. Um, and when this was published, they had 14 weeks after the second dose of data included, um, and they had built into their protocol a stopping rule. So if there was um, basically a certain amount of unfavorable, adverse, severe events, um, then that would, it would automatically trigger, it was some computer algorithm type thing, and it would automatically trigger and um, bring that to attention, but that was never triggered. Um, so for efficacy, um, their first primary endpoint was um, efficacy against confirmed COVID-19 with onset at least seven days after the second dose in participants without any evidence of infection up to that second days after a dose, after the second dose. So um, that was their, their primary endpoint in the population of people who had not previously had infection. Um, and there was a criteria, the FDA criteria they used for confirmed COVID-19. Their second primary endpoint was efficacy in participants with and without evidence of prior infection, so bringing in also people who had had it before. Um, and then their major secondary endpoint, um, I kind of laughed, the second primary endpoint versus the major secondary endpoint. Um, but efficacy of the vaccine against severe COVID-19 as defined by FDA criteria for severe COVID-19, uh, which you can see listed there. So their statistical analysis. So in the safety analysis, they included everybody who got at least one dose of vaccine or placebo. Um, and then, again, the solicited adverse events only came from this reactogenicity subset, which was only 8,000 um, people. So sm definitely, you know, much smaller than the total group. Um, and then they um, gave the um, descriptive findings for those that information that we'll get to. And then analysis of the first primary um, efficacy endpoint included everyone who had no evidence of infection within seven days after the second dose and no major protocol deviations. Um, so that was the per protocol population. And the vaccine efficacy was estimated by 100 times 1 minus the incidence rate ratio. Um, so calculated ratio of confirmed cases of COVID-19 per 1,000 person years of follow-up. Um, and basically their, their goal was to be 95% sure that the vaccine efficacy was greater than 30%. Um, and actually you'll see in the Moderna study, they also used this 30% level. Um, and so they made it sound like that was kind of like an FDA, um, criteria or kind of low minimum for efficacy for a vaccine. Um, and yeah, so that's what they were both aiming for, at least 30% efficacy. And we all know that they both exceeded that by a lot. Um, so in terms of the participants, um, they received shots through July, July through November. And um, this study did have some international locations in Argentina, Brazil, South Africa, Germany, and Turkey. Um, so uh, in comparison to the Moderna that was all in the United States. Um, and then they took the approach of subdividing by age, um, basically into two groups. So ages 16 to 55 years old, um, and then older, this should be greater than 55. Um, sorry about that. So those are kind of the two main groups within um, the vaccine and the placebo categories. So you can see they started with 44 plus thousand um, and people who got um, two doses of each ended up being about 
eighteen and a half thousand in each category. Um, so here's kind of the general um, demographics of the participants. Um, so you see, you know, about 50-50 in uh, gender, um, definitely a high um, percentage of um, white population, um, with Hispanic being the next most populous, um, I think based on, you know, the locations where it was done. Um, the locations and then the age group, so a little bit more in the younger age group. Um, and... Yeah, those are kind of the main things there. So in terms of um, the results in uh, safety results, looking specifically first at local reactogenicity, um, the vaccine recipients reported more local reactions than placebo. Um, the local reactions were mostly mild to moderate and resolved within one to two days, and they did not increase after the second dose, and there was no grade four local reactions. Um, mild to moderate pain was the most common um, local side effect and um, usually occurred within seven days. Less than 1% reported severe pain. And um, as Dr. Pandya had mentioned in her lecture, um, the older group actually, um, you'll see this as a theme in both of these studies, the older group reported less side effects in general. Um, so less pain compared to the younger group. Um, and then a very low percentage of people had redness or swelling. It was mostly pain. Um, and then in terms of systemic side effects, again, systemic reactions were more reported by the younger group and more often after dose two compared to dose one. Um, most of them were within one to two days after vaccination and resolved shortly. Um, fatigue was the biggest one, so you can compare um, vaccine to placebo, so 59% in the younger group um, in the vaccine group, and then 23% in the younger placebo group, um, and then you can also compare younger to older per group, so 59% in the, in the younger group versus 51% in the older vaccine group. Um, so headache... Um, after the second dose, this was fatigue after the second dose specifically. Um, you can see similar numbers, but a little bit lower. And then fever after the second dose, um, again, more so in the younger vaccine group compared to the older vaccine group. Um, fever, like high fevers, basically were very rare, even though there were a couple of people in each group who had greater than 40. Um, and then antipyretic use, that was one thing they wanted to look at. Um, so again, you can kind of see there um, more so in the younger vaccine group compared to the older vaccine group, um, and more so after dose one compared to dose two. Oh, sorry, more after um, dose two compared to dose one. Um, and significantly more in the vaccine group compared to placebo. Um, the frequency of any severe systemic event after the first dose was very low. Um, severe systemic events were reported in less than 2% of vaccines, except for the fatigue and headache after the second dose. And then um, basically people use the electronic diary um, very well on a, on a daily basis. Um, so here is the main figure for um, local side effects. Um, so you'll see vaccine and placebo in each of these categories. You can see the categories down here, pain, redness, swelling. Um, and then it's divided into their, their um, major age groups. So the younger patient population and the older patient population, and then dose one and dose two. Um, and then the bars represent the confidence intervals and the numbers above are the percentages. Um, and then you also have the colors, which are the severity of grade. Um, and so I put over here in this um, table, just a description of what 
mild, moderate, severe, and grade four um, mean for each of the categories. Uh, but there was no grade four results, very few severe results. So mostly it was uh, mild to moderate. Um, and you see that pain was definitely more significant than any of the other side effects and more so um, in the vaccine groups compared to the placebo groups. Um, here's the same sort of graph for the systemic events. Um, and this is looking at fever, fatigue, headache, chills, vomiting, diarrhea, muscle pain, joint pain, and then the use of antipyretic medications. Um, so again, fatigue and headache, and then um, muscle pain and chills are kind of the, the most common ones. Um, and again, um, no grade four reactions and very small number of severe reactions. Um, up here, or here again, is the, the table describing them for each category. And then um, these describe it for temperature at the top. Um, so that was the systemic events. Um, so kind of to sum it up, so any adverse events, 27% um, vaccine versus 12% in the placebo. And then they always look at the adverse events and say which ones they think actually were related um, to the injection. So those numbers change a little bit. Um, there was a fair amount of lymphadenopathy um, that was seen more so in the vaccine group. And then a couple of other related serious adverse events were listed. Um, you can see there shoulder um, injury, axillary lymphadenopathy, paroxysmal ventricular arrhythmia, and leg paresthesia. Um, no, there were no deaths related to the vaccine placebo or infection, and none of those stopping rules were met. Um, and the safety monitoring will continue for two years. Um, now looking at efficacy results. So the primary, primary analysis was again looking seven days after the second injection um, in patients who had not had infection before. Um, there were eight cases in the vaccine group and 162 in the placebo group, which gives us the 95% vaccine efficacy using a case split analysis um, with our 95% confidence intervals. Um, their secondary analysis was including those who had had infection before. Um, and you see that didn't change too much, almost 95% vaccine efficacy again. Um, and then they also did other analyses looking at individual subgroups. And basically, um, there wasn't big differences. We'll get to a table that shows that. And then um, they did look. Um, basically at the cases that occurred after the first dose but before the second dose um, and found that there was a first dose vaccine efficacy of about just over 50 percent. Um, so the, the study wasn't really designed to look at first dose vaccine efficacy um, but that's what they saw looking back at that. And then early protection was noted as soon as 12 days after the first dose. Um, so these are their two major analyses with and without um, or without and then with people who had prior infection and you see um, that their probability of the vaccine efficacy being greater than 30 percent um, is greater than 99.99 percent probability so um, they met their goals um, and then the efficacy table um, by group. So basically just looking down this column, you see the different vaccine efficacies per subgroup. Um, so 95 overall, and then you see, you know, this is all, um, you know, pretty similar. Um, lowest down here, but they didn't have a lot of cases in Brazil. Um, and if you're greater than 75, then looks like it works extra great for you. Um, no, there was, just wasn't a lot of cases. But um, so basically the subgroups were pretty similar there. Um, 
So in the discussion section about efficacy, they met both their primary efficacy endpoints, um, more than 99.99% probability of a true vaccine efficacy greater than 30%. Um, and again, not powered to really assess um, some of the other things like by subgroups, but they were um, also looked pretty similar. Um, and then the cumulative incidence of cases over time begins to diverge by 12 days after the first dose, and we'll get to that um, graphic. Um, and then we talked about this 52%. Um, so after the second dose, but before seven days after the second dose, the efficacy was 91%, and then it went up to 95% after the seven days. Um, there were 10 cases of severe COVID observed um, starting after the first dose, um, but only one of them occurred in the vaccine group. Um, so that's some preliminary evidence that there is vaccine-mediated protection um, against severe disease. So here's that other graph um, we saw with Dr. Pandita's lecture, um, looking at the cumulative incidence of COVID-19 um, after the first dose in the modified intention to treat population. Um, each symbol is a case, and the filled symbols are severe cases. Um, and so we see right here about um, day 12 or so that, that there starts to be a split um, in that the vaccine group um, stops having, you know, as many as the, um, the placebo group. Um, and so let's see, you can see down here um, just some more details of those numbers. So looking just after dose one versus after dose one, two, dose two, um, and then after dose two, up to seven days after dose two, and then after seven days after dose two. Um, so discussion about the safety, most of the reactions were mild to moderate and less common in people over 55 years of age. Uh, systemic side effects were more common and severe after the second dose, um, but local reactions were fairly similar um, after both doses. Severe, severe fatigue was observed in 4% of vaccine recipients, um, and this is higher than most previous vaccines, um, but not as bad as another vaccine out there. Um, and so, you know, within the range of previous vaccines um, in general. Uh, most of the events were transient, resolving only a couple of days. Um, lymphadenopathy was, was um, seen, and that one did take longer to resolve, up to 10 days. And then the incidence of serious adverse events was similar um, in the vaccine and placebo groups. Um, so a little bit about limitations. Um, so basically, it, it had enough um, power to be able to identify adverse events if their true incidence um, was greater than 0 0.01, but the study was not large enough to detect less common adverse events um, if they occurred less often than that. Um, so I think that's important when thinking about like the hypersensitivity stuff. Um, that we've now seen since um, people have been vaccinated. Um, the follow-up data was limited to 14 weeks, although now it's ongoing. Um, and let's see, it doesn't, they did not look at asymptomatic infection at all, and they did not look at younger adolescents, children, and um, pregnant women. Um, I guess they did have a little bit of data on um, some patients who are um, 12 to 50, or some participants who are 12 to 15 years of age. Um, it wasn't really clear how many or why they were doing that when their inclusion criteria was greater than 16, but apparently they have some data um, and they're planning on doing additional studies in some of these other special risk groups. Um, they did bring up the, what Dr. Pandya had talked about with these mRNA viruses um, requiring these very cold temperatures for shipping and storage. Um, they are hoping to do ongoing stability studies to try and optimize that so that it's not as much of an issue. 
Um, these results demonstrate that COVID-19 can be prevented by immunization um, and our proof of concept of RNA-based vaccines as a promising new approach um, to vaccines, especially when we need to come out with them quickly, such as in a pandemic situation. Um, and then they also reported, you know, they obviously liked this continuous phase one, two, three trial design um, to speed up the process, um, as would anyone wanting to get a vaccine out there and make money quickly. Um, but, I mean, also for the benefit of people just not making the process so long. Um, so that is it for the um, Pfizer vaccine. Um, I'll stop right here for a second as I've been talking a lot quickly. Um, are, are there any questions specifically about this first article or the Pfizer vaccine? So, Sean, this is Chris. I had some questions too. Um, was there any data about like antibody production and um, T cell response and things like that? Um, most of that was um, came from the um, like the phase one trials. Yeah. Um, so they had um, just mentioned in this article that the mean titers exceeded the titers of um, patients who had had disease, um, and then that there was a ro robust antigen-specific CD8 positive and Th1 type CD4 positive T cell responses. Um, that's really all that they listed in this article, um, but it sounded like there was kind of more details in that initial phase one trial article um, that was published before this one. Okay, got it. Got it. I was uh, a little bit curious just because, you know, we we follow titers in people and we look at like pneumococcal and what's considered relatively protective and things like that. And that'll be interesting to, to see how that pans out over time. Um, what's it too? So, okay. Thanks. Yeah, no, it's, it's a great thing. Um, and we'll get to it here in um, the, in the Moderna article, they, they bring that up and they, um, I had to look this up, but um, they call it a, a correlate of protection um, that they're that they they we need to identify a correlate of protection. And so, my understanding of that is just basically kind of what you're saying that that we we find that there's like an antibody level that is protective. And so we can we can um, look at efficacy of the vaccine based on the antibody titers rather than based on just um, you know clinical having the infection or not. Yeah. Um, so they, they mentioned that this hasn't been identified, um, but they hope that in, in the future it will be. Yeah. Okay. So per, fantastic. Um, you know, what, what I'm thinking is the best proof is just not getting the disease and their data looks pretty good on the, on the yeah. time they had. The, the other part though, eventually as we look at, are we going to need continuous boosters and what about new strains and things like that? Um, Somewhere along the line, I bet we're going to be looking at protective titers and does somebody need to boost or not, but that time will tell on that. Yeah, I think, um, you know, obviously this is just very limited data, on, you know, in a t time standpoint. So um, definitely we don't know how, you know, all those questions that you brought up, you know, how um, this is our antibodies are going to wane over time and things like that. Thanks. Yep. Any other questions before we look at the Moderna one? Okay. Um, there were definitely parts of this article that I, I think I liked a little bit better and uh, just in terms of the study in general, um, comparing the two, there were kind of a couple little odd things, um, but we'll We'll get into it. So this was published 20 days after the um, Pfizer um, article, also in the New England Journal of Medicine. Um, and this is a mRNA uh, 1273 um, SARS-CoV-2 vaccine. Um, so they dubbed their trial the COVE trial um, to have a nice fancy name. Um, and this is a phase three trial. Um, and so they kind of talked about what we talked about with the mRNA vaccine platform having advantages. Um, 
And then I thought this was interesting. So earlier work um, with the 2002 SARS out, outbreak had identified um, this spike protein of the coronavirus was a, a suitable target. Um, and so this um, mRNA vaccine really came on the shoulders of this previous SARS outbreak um, and the work on creating a vaccine at that time. Um, so similarly, it's a lipid nanoparticle encapsulated mRNA vaccine ex expressing the prefusion stabilized spike glycoprotein um, and was developed by Moderna. Um, they also listed a, a number of people involved um, with the study as well, which I thought um, brings a lot of good credibility. Vaccine Research Center at the National um, Institute of Allergy and Infectious Diseases within the NIH. Um, and we'll get to a couple others on this next slide. Um, again, they had had, you know, phase one trial data that was um, encouraging. And um, they made a big point throughout this article of um, saying that they had an independent data and safety monitoring board. Um, and they bring that up a lot, that they had this, this independent um, group that was looking um, at both safety and um, efficacy, which I think is always good as well to have independent people involved. Um, so this is a phase three randomized stratified observer-blinded placebo-controlled trial. Um, with adults in medically stable condition. Um, all of the sites were within the U.S. from July to October. Um, and they mentioned, you know, all of these kind of things that they followed, um, good clinical practice guidelines and government regulations and all of these things. Um, and then, again, some other people involved um, in the overall study, um, the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, um, that NIAID and the COVID-19 Prevention Network, um, and then, of course, Moderna um, was the main organization. Um, and they just mentioned that, you know, some people as a part of this had to be, had to be unblinded, so the people giving the shots, and then some of the people monitoring, um, especially safety, um, were unblinded so that they could know who was actually getting the vaccine or, or not, but um, everybody else was, was blinded to the data, um, well, to who had vaccine versus placebo. Um, so um, elig eligible participants were 18 years and older, um, so versus 16 in the other article, um, and again, no known history of um, infection. And then they also included, which I thought was cool, um, trying to get more people in the study that had locations or circumstances that put them at appreciable risk um, for severe COVID-19 um, or just COVID-19 infection. Um, and they also um, follow this uh, FDA draft guidance um, and, and tried to um, employ different um, ways to increase the number of racial and ethnic minorities that were in the trial population, um, which I thought was also a, a really cool thing about this study. Um, they were randomly assigned a uh, one-to-one -one ratio uh, vaccine or placebo, and then they stratified in a little bit different way than the previous study. Um, they had persons 65 years and older, and then um, younger was split into those with or without heightened risk for severe COVID-19. So those kind of three populations um, they were looking at mainly. And then um, they used um, these CDC criteria risk factors for severe COVID-19. You can see there chronic lung disease, cardiac disease, severe obesity, um, diabetes, liver disease, and HIV infection. Um, and we talked about this here and then um, and this here, that they have this independent data and safety monitoring um, board that we're looking at efficacy data and then unblinded safety data at the participant level. Um, 
So patients were given um, the vaccine, 0.5 mLs, um, which contain 100 micrograms of the mRNA or placebo, and they were given a two-dose two regimen 28 days apart rather than the 21 days apart in the previous study. Um, they also talked about the, the cold storage um, things that were, you know, requirements that were needed to keep these um, vaccines, um, you know, in good working order. Um, and so as far as the safety assessments and what they were looking at uh, for safety data, um, they kind of broke it down into these categories. So solicited local adverse events within seven days of injection or solicited systemic adverse events, and then unsolicited adverse events up to 28 days after injection, and then adverse events leading to discontinuation from a dose or from the study, and then medically attended adverse events and serious adverse events. And then um, they were also monitoring for the cases of COVID-19 or severe COVID-19. So um, from an efficacy standpoint, um, they, um, their primary endpoint was efficacy of the vaccine in preventing the first occur occurrence of symptomatic COVID-19 at least 14 days after the second injection. Um, so again, also, you know, compared to the Pfizer, um, they went out to 14 days after the second injection rather than seven days after the second injection. And their second injection was given after 28 days versus 21. Um, so this was in the per protocol population among patients who had no evidence of previous disease. Um, and in this study, I thought it was um, it's important to note that they did do um, COVID testing prior to each injection. So not just prior to the study, um, but also prior to um, the second injection. And then, of course, if they were symptomatic, they were following these patients daily um, to assess their um, symptoms. Um, they also looked at um, the primary endpoint evaluated across different um, subgroups listed there. And then they had secondary endpoints. Um, so the first one being prevention of severe COVID-19 and then efficacy of the vaccine after a single dose and efficacy um, of the vaccine and preventing COVID-19 according to a secondary, less restrictive definition than the definition that they used for their primary um, endpoint. Um, so basically having any symptoms of COVID-19 and a positive test um, versus having at least two of the following symptoms and, and a positive test, basically. Um, so for their statistical analysis, um, their tri the trial was designed um, for the null hypothesis that, that the efficacy of the vaccine is 30% or less. So again, that same number um, that they were trying to see if um, the vaccine efficacy was greater than. Um, and basically, they, they were thinking with um, that, that they would be powered to detect actually a 60% vaccine um, efficacy. Um, and they plan to, to look um, at different time points before even their final time point. Um, looking at efficacy and that it could be demonstrated at either of those earlier time points or at their, um, at the point at which they got 151 cases, which would be, um, uh, would give them the power that they, that they were looking for. Um, so they, um, actually did their first early analysis and found, um, that the efficacy was around 94.5 percent um, and so the monitoring board was like hey you should share this data with um, the participants and the community even though 
they hadn't um, reached their kind of primary number of cases that they were um, trying to get to have enough power. Um, and so the way that they defined vaccine efficacy was the percentage of reduction in the hazard ratio of the primary endpoint. And they looked at it in these different populations. So the full analysis would be everyone who got at least one dose, um, the modified intention to treat population, um, those who had no evidence of COVID-19 um, on day one before the first dose, <clears throat> regardless of whether or not they got um, both vaccines. And then per protocol would be they got um, both vaccines and no major protocol deviations. Um, and then they use a stratified Cox proportional hazards model um, and reported the uh, confidence intervals. Um, vaccine safety was assessed in the safety population, and that was defined as all those who received at least one injection and reported a solicited adverse event. Um, so again, comparing this to the Pfizer study, um, I thought this was interesting because with the Pfizer, they focused on um, that smaller population of, of patients where they would um, you know, ask for solicited uh, responses about adverse events. Um, and in this study, they really did it for almost everyone and included everyone who reported something. Um, and then, um, yeah, they just disport, um, dis use descriptive summary data um, to describe what they found with the adverse safety events. So the trial population demographics are here. Um, infection at baseline was similar between the two groups, around two two percent. Um, Ninety six, more than ninety percent, six percent of the um, of the group received a second dose, and um, they had good um, follow up. Uh, mean follow up duration was sixty three days after the second dose. Um, with a lot of the patients having at least 56 days of follow-up. And uh, this kind of highlights um, what maybe is too small to see over here. So just kind of the mean age around 50, um, a little less than 50, 50 um, male or female to male, 25% um, were in this older age group. 16 to 17% were younger than 65 and had um, risk of severe infection. And then the race, racial and ethnic proportions were generally representative of U.S. demographics. Um, here's their kind of participant um, flow sheet. So you see um, in the end, the people in the per protocol analysis were about 14,000 per group um, compared to the like 18,500 per group in the previous study. Um, so as far as results go, there's a lot on this slide. Um, there, we'll talk more about this um, a little bit later, but um, there was no evidence of vaccine-associated enhanced respiratory disease. So that was a big thing. Um, local events were more common in the vaccine group. Um, were mainly grade one or two and lasted less than three days. The most common was pain. There was some delayed reactions um, that were characterized by erythema in duration and tenderness, um, but those resolved within a week. Um, these local adverse events were more common in the younger group, just like in the previous study and less common in patients who were um, positive for the disease at baseline, so prior to starting the study. And then in terms of systemic events, they were more common in the vaccine group. Um, the severity of the systemic events increased after the second dose compared to the first dose. Um, so grade two events went from 16 to 38 percent, and grade three events went from 3 percent to almost 16 percent, um, and um, the duration was still about three days um, 
for systemic events. They were more also more common in the younger um, group and less common in those who were um, SARS-CoV-2 positive at baseline. In terms of unsolicited adverse events, severe adverse events, and serious adverse events, they were really generally similar in the vaccine and placebo groups. Um, and so grade three events was around, you know, 1.3 to 1.5%. Serious event, events was 0.6%, but in, again, in both groups. Um, and then they did list specifically hypersensitivity reactions, um, but it was 1.5% in the vaccine group and 1.1% in the placebo group. So pretty similar um, to the point where they didn't feel like that was a statistically significant increase in hypersensitivity reactions. Um, this study did find um, that three patients in the vaccine group compared to one patient in the placebo group developed Bell's palsy um, more than about a month after injection. Um, and so that was something not listed in the Pfizer study, um, but something that they saw in, in this Moderna study um, and seemed to be potentially, you know, a, a greater number. Um, we'll talk more about that later. So um, medically ad attended adverse events, events leading to discontinuation from a dose or study. Again, these were um, all pretty similar and, in fact, you know, a little bit higher in the placebo group. Um, in, in these two sections. And then treatment-related events um, were reported in 8% of the vaccine group, 4.5% in the placebo group, and the biggest ones, again, were fatigue and headache. Um, and there was a little bit um, more um, severe adverse events reported in the vaccine group compared to the placebo group. Um, here is their figure in terms of um, safety. So we're looking at percentage of participants who had a solicited local or systemic adverse event um, within seven days after injection of dose one or two. So we see the grades similar to the other one, grade one, two, and three. There's no grade four um, in these. And then um, these are the placebo after dose one and two, and then um, the vaccine after dose one and two. And um, these are local events here, systemic events here. For local events, we looked at any versus pain, erythema swelling, and lymphadenopathy. So similar um, um, types of side effects and kind of the distribution is similar. So pain was the biggest one and more so in the vaccine group. And then for systemic events, we're looking at any versus fever, headache, fatigue, myalgias, arthralgias, nausea, vomiting, and chills. And again, fatigue, headache, myalgia, those were the highest ones, and more so in the vaccine group um, after dose two. In terms of results for efficacy, their primary analysis showed a 94.1% efficacy, uh, similar to the 95% efficacy in the Pfizer study. Um, and findings were similar across key secondary analyses um, with the different subgroups. And so they, they kind of looked at a whole host of different kind of ways or different population um, groups to look at efficacy as well. So um, some get a little bit confusing as to, you know, what, what does that really mean different? Um, but going through some of those, so including, including cases starting at 17 days after dose one, um, the efficacy was similar. Looking just between first and second dose, so um, kind of like a first dose efficacy, although for some reason they expanded this to include um, people symptomatic with the standard versus the secondary definition and including asymptomatic or people testing positive or asymptomatic testing positive individuals. So um, in the modified intention to treat population. So this was a much like bigger population, including a lot of um, more cases, but the efficacy 
after dose one was almost up to 90 percent um, compared to the just over 50 percent in the Pfizer study. But again, I don't know if you can compare them completely because they kind of expanded their um, population group to look at that number. Um, so it's 0.3% of the placebo group and 0.1% of the vaccine group were identified as asymptomatic um, SARS-CoV-2 positive prior to their second injection. So again, that gives us some thought that maybe we're having some benefit from that first injection um, because those rates were lower. And this was in asymptomatic um, positive test patients, which um, the Pfizer study did not look at at all. Um, and then efficacy from days one to two weeks after dose two, um, efficacy of preventing severe COVID-19. So they, they ended up having um, 30 cases in the placebo, placebo group and zero cases in the vaccine group. Um, so an efficacy of 100%. Um, and then including participants who were positive at baseline, the efficacy was a little bit lower. Um, one of the things that I couldn't quite figure out, they said that of the, um, of the participants positive for SARS-CoV-2 at baseline, only one case of COVID-19 was subsequently diagnosed, and that patient was in the placebo group. But comparing these numbers to these numbers up here in the primary analysis, we have 12 versus 11, and then 187 versus 185. So those don't seem to match up to me, and I double-checked that a few times, but that is how it was written, so maybe there's something I just don't understand there. Um, but either way, um, you know, less in the vaccine group. Um, so here is a similar sort of graph to the one we saw in the Pfizer study. This is looking, though, at cumulative incidence rate. Um, in the modified intention to treat um, and the per protocol. So per protocol, modified intention to treat. The arrows indicate the times of vaccination. The dotted line is at 14 days after <clears throat> vaccine two, so when they started kind of their primary analysis. Um, and, um, and then they only included symptomatic cases in this. So in the per protocol analysis, we see kind of starting here at their primary endpoint date, um, you know, just that's, I don't know, visually very clear that immediately we're having a lot more, um, that the incidence rate is a lot higher in the placebo. And then looking back um, at the modified intention to treat, so starting at, at the beginning, we also see a similar sort of split um, in the incidence rate around probably 12 to 15 days um, in there, which was fairly similar um, to that Pfizer study, is that when, when we first kind of start seeing a split in the groups um, at kind of 12 or so days after that first injection. Um, and then, um, you know, similar type numbers. I don't think we need to go over those. Um, so we can finish up here quick. Um, so the efficacy in the different subgroups um, in the per protocol population. So again, we were almost 95% overall. Um, and then looking at all these numbers, you know, the lowest is 86%. Um, but most are pretty similar to that 95%. Um, they had to pool the communities of color, as they called them, um, just to have enough to get statistically significant information. So on discussion of efficacy, the COVE trial provided evidence of short-term efficacy of this vaccine in preventing symptomatic SARS-CoV-2 infection. Um, all of the severe cases were, um, were in the placebo group. So Although not designed or powered to study that, there is some evidence that it helps prevent against severe COVID infection. Um, they also weren't designed to evaluate efficacy of a single dose. But again, um, looking at it, especially in compared to the Pfizer, it looked like maybe there is some um, better um, efficacy after just a single dose. Um, 
they included that the magnitude of overall efficacy is better than the influenza vaccine, which had a pooled efficacy around 60%. Um, and they acknowledge um, waning efficacy um, over time, but we don't have that data there. And then I thought they brought this um, up a good point is that this study was done in the setting of national recommendations for masking and social distancing. Um, so basically they're saying their efficacy could be um, kind of falsely elevated um, if, you know, we, if the population wasn't doing all of these um, sort of masking and social distancing things to limit um, transmission. So I thought that, that was a good point um, to, to think about in both of these studies is that the population is skewed because of those um, national recommendations. And then similar efficacy to the previous vaccine. In terms of safety, it was reassuring and most um, local reactions were delayed or were mild, delayed were uncommon, moderate to severe uh, systemic side effects. Um, occurred in about 50% of the vaccine group after the second dose, um, but were generally transient, um, lasting not more than two or three days. Um, the degree of side effects after one dose was less than the most recently approved Zoster vaccine, but was similar after the second dose. Um, and overall, um, the overall incidence of unsolicited adverse events was similar between groups. Um, there was no risk of hypersensitivity evident in this trial, although, again, they um, report the ability to detect rare events like this is limited given the trial sample size. Um, they brought up that Bell's palsy that we talked about, um, that even though there weren't a lot of people who had it, we should monitor for it. Um, because of the differences in numbers. Um, and we kind of mentioned this before too, there was no evidence of enhanced respiratory disease. So a word about that, apparently when they were trying to come up with um, vaccines for the SARS and the MERS um, outbreaks, there was some evidence in animal models that after vaccination, um, you could actually have worse disease if you got it. Um, and so that's something that um, that they you know just report that that didn't take place. There was much less severe COVID nineteen disease um, in patients who are vaccinated. So that's very reassuring. Um, so some limitations in looking ahead. Again, similar things, short duration, but they continue to will continue to monitor for two years. We talked about a lack of um, a correlate, identified correlate of protection. So we um, just have to look at symptomatic cases really to see if um, this is effective rather than antibody titers, but hopefully in the future we can get those um, or that figured out. Um, the data was not sufficient to assess asymptomatic infection, um, but they want to do more studies on that. Um, their um, evaluation was limited in some subgroups um, and hope that with longer term data we'll get more information there. Similarly to the Pfizer study, pregnant women and children were excluded, um, but they hope to do some additional evaluation in those groups. Um, and again, this, this mRNA um, model for vaccines, uh, you know, worked really well and that both of these studies, um, you know, they were able to produce it within a year of um, getting the genetic sequence of these, um, that, or, um, genetic sequence of the viruses. Um, so that concludes the second one and hopefully I was able to highlight a few similarities and differences between the two. Um, but both with great eff efficacy and um, pretty good safety data. So uh, it was fun to go through all of that and um, learn about these two vaccines. Um, if there's any other questions, I can take them now. Jordan, I may have missed this on the presentation, but did they have, did they know that they had people that um, missed the, um, the four weeks or whatever, um, timeline where they were they were you know five weeks or four weeks and a half or anything like that 
Um, oh, as far as getting that second dose? Yeah. Um, I know they did not mention anything about, um, about like kind of the, the average number of days that people came back. Um, I, th I think there may have been, um, oh yeah. Yeah. So here I think is the only thing that was mentioned. So, um, in, in these figures, um, 93 received dose two outside of the dose two window, which I think was like only like plus or minus one or two days um, from that 28 days. Um, and then 109 in the placebo group received the dose two outside of the window. Um, so those people were excluded from the per protocol analysis, um, but I believe were included in the modified intention to treat analysis. Okay, that's what I was curious about. One where they were they included in the data if they if they were you know because all these studies will have um, you, you have to come in with you know um, you know one or two days plus or minus when it's due or whatever the time period is. And um, um, the other the other issue is that um, there's been a lot um, said about um, especially with the shortage of vaccines about delaying. Um, the second vaccine, and if you can do that, you know, could you delay five or six weeks? Would it be as efficacious? Um, and um, um, you know, while they're ramping up production and stuff. So um, I was just curious if they had any any patients that they even that they were late that they still let them get the second shot or something and kept data on it. Yeah, I think they let them get the second shot, and they were included in the, the greater, like, modified intention to treat analysis, but I don't think that they looked specifically at that subset of patients to, you know, see specifically if, if that was okay, that they had a late, you know, vaccine administration. Um, so I would say that really the only data that would uh, kind of apply to that question would be looking at that kind of uh, first dose efficacy number um, and, um, you know, what sort of efficacy are we getting just after that first dose? And so is that enough that we can delay giving the second dose? Yeah. Okay. Um, does anybody else have any other questions for Jordan? If not, we will end COLA for um, February 12th. And thank you for your presentation, Jordan. Yeah, no problem. That was fun. Have a good weekend, everyone. Thanks, Jordan.